Welcome to Industry 4.0. Hey guys, welcome to Industry 4.0. This is episode 20. Uh, it's hard to believe we've made it through 20 episodes together. And although I wish J Buds was here for this moment, we do have a lot to talk about today. Um, what's going on, guys? I'm joined today by Irvin, Kyle, and Ryan. How's it going? Doing well. Doing, doing well? awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey. Nice. As always. Yeah. Always good to hear everyone else is doing okay. Always but, awesome um, when I'm with you guys. And it's, it's a good thing that you're starting off in a good mood because we have more Equifax news today, which I know everybody is so excited to talk about. <laughs> and But before we do that, we'll kind of ease our audience in with a little bit of lighthearted news and some exciting developments from around the, the makerspace with iOS and Google and, uh, and everything else. So just to jump right into the first topic, we have the Google acquisition of, excuse me, HTC. So, um, yeah. They didn't fully acquire the mobile division like rumors had said they would, but they only required about acquired about 2,000 out of the 4,000 employees. I know we were talking about this a little bit earlier, Urban. What are your, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on, on this acquisition, because this could be big. HTC is good for making really high quality hardware and we but we all know the pixel was a great phone yeah so i've been a fan of htc's hardware for uh, a long time i've used i've used several htc phones before uh previously and and loved every single one of them um and then the latest pixel is, is a great piece of hardware and uh this um uh, acquisition if you want to call that is 2000 people that mainly worked on the pixel phone uh, from HTC um, then that, and that's half of all the engineers at HTC which is just ridiculous so they have total 4,000 engineers working at HTC and they took Google just took half of them away from the okay. company just to solely work on Google products um, this is ridiculous um, yeah, there's this um, this statement on Google's blog from Rick Osterloh, um, just talking about how excited Google is. Their standard kind of boilerplate company excitement to work with the new talent coming across. Um, but some of the things he actually goes into kind of brought back some memories. Like you were saying, you had a lot of HTC phones, such as, and then um, they go into talking about the T-Mobile G1, yeah. HTC Dream, which was the original Android smartphone. And the Nexus One, which came out, the Nexus Nine, and the Pixel, like we mentioned, and um, okay. HTC. I've I haven't been a fan of some of their recent hardware decisions, such as the I think it was the U11, um, the Chrome Blue phone that <laughs> was like yeah. incredibly boring in the space of phones that came out at that time. But that being said, um, their build quality and their um, close knit ties with Google are what actually convinced me to upgrade to the pixel, the original pixel, instead of, um, waiting for the pixel Two. I was able to catch it for cheap and I'm thoroughly impressed with the build quality of this phone. It's just a very solid all around phone. And I'm excited that they're taking the HTC members who worked with them on this phone because that only kind of inspires confidence in the phones that Google's going to put forward coming through the next couple of years. And the, the main reason I think they, they want to push this hardware division of Google and actually start pushing more and more products out. And I think they need to, to compete with the Apples and Samsungs of the world, uh, because they really haven't made a dent. I don't know how many pixel phones you see in public. Right. Um, depending on, on the group of friends that you might hang out with, you might see more, but on average, I don't think me, most people see uh, many pixel phones. They see more Samsung and, and of course iPhones. Um, right. What are the rest of you guys think that this, do you think this will be a good move towards making a Google an actual hardware vendor, a hardware manufacturer, a viable one at that? I think so for sure. I mean, you look at obviously, like we already touched on, they have a history of working together in the past anyway. You yeah. take these people who, I mean, as you we've listened to you guys through the the, the various episodes where we touched on HTC phones. I mean, clearly they have a good build. So you take 
the innovation that Google has, plus these people who have the history of making such good builds. And I, I think we're in for something special. I think you're going to see some, mm-hmm. it's nice to have some more competition in, in the physically what has become to a certain extent, sometimes, sometimes some of the, the phones start to get bland or almost look like each other. Uh, and it's all about what's on the inside. Sometimes you want that switch up. You want it to look a little different from the outside as well. So I think it's, I think it's, it's like, like we always say, competition's healthy. Competition's always welcome. So. Mm-hmm. Especially when it comes from such good talent. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. With this, yeah I agree. They- I mean, I, I have to say, I, I, I've never used the Pixel personally, and I hear what you guys have to say about the Pixel, which gets me excited. But having used HTC devices in the past and, and outside HTC, T, HTC devices like the 310, the 320, the uh, HD2s and stuff like that, I don't have as much faith in HTC. But considering the fact that Google has kind of handpicked this team out, I'm a little more uh, optimistic. Mm-hmm. And with this, they also get um, rights to use any of HCC's patents. I don't know what those patents um, are or how much value that they bring, but it's Hopefully good. one of them is boom sound. <laughs> it, yeah, the, the famous boom sound. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and it's not an exclusive right for just Google. So it's just that Google is just allowed to use them, but so is anyone else who wants to make a deal with HCC. Um, but it's still good that they get access to whatever cool patents that HCC might be holding of, integrate that, uh, like the boom sound into their next phone. That would be uh, amazing. Remember when boom sound was uh, made by Beats, right? And then Beats got bought by Apple and then boom sound went, sort of went away. <laughs> that was that, that was called boom sound? Yeah, there... boom sound was originally, well, together, HCC and Beats partnered up to create boom sound, and then Beats got bought, bought by Apple, and then that okay. stopped. Yeah. <laughs> is that what put, is that what eventually got, I don't, I didn't know about this, is that what eventually got rid of boom sound, or? What? Yeah, so that's, that, that sort of the special sauce that Beats put in that made it sound so well, oh. they moved on to another technology after Beats got bought by Apple, because Apple wouldn't let anyone else use that special whatever sauce that makes it nice and boomy and that th- deep bass that everyone likes that beat sound um that the that. headphones give off um so yeah <laughs> oh man learn something new every day <laughs> um but i'm actually looking forward to this so mm-hmm. like i i don't think i can stress it enough i know that uh these these two companies have a long history together and it's good to see that they're actually starting to merge and once you get HTC's um, build quality combined with Google's intimate knowledge of software and the Android operating system as a whole, I think the future of Android itself looks exciting with phones like this kind of leading the flagship market. Yeah, definitely. So mm-hmm. last week we talked a lot about Apple's stuff that the new re- released. One of those things was iOS 11 that got released recently to um, all uh, Apple phones. Uh, so uh, pretty much everyone uh, who has an iPhone uh, is now can download this iOS 11. And there's an interesting feature uh, in there uh, within Safari that advertising advertisers are not really a fan of. I actually all. heard about this and their like open letter was like the funniest yeah. thing I'd ever read. <laughs> uh, so just, just to briefly describe what this is. So inside of Safari, and iOS 11, uh, and specifically Safari, uh, Apple made a, a fairly big change on the way that it uh, collects cookies. So cookies are, are things that websites leave behind as you're traveling on them to keep your preferences or uh, a lot. It, they, they actually store a lot of information uh, about that website. So in this new update, now they um, will limit who can leave cookies on your phone. So previously, uh, sites could, or advertisers in particular, could track you as you're traveling across the internet. So they know exactly, okay, you you were on Facebook or you were on uh, ESPN.com and then you went to uh, CNN.com right after that. And then they see that from there, you went on to some other site. They can track your exact progress from one side to another. These are advertisers that can do this. These cookies um, last a long time too. Yes, they do. And they collect a lot of information and they store this information. They send it to the servers and then they potentially sell it 
uh, to uh, make more money um, off that data. So with this new update uh, in Safari and iOS 11, only sites that you physically uh, travel to are able to uh, store cookies and other sites cannot access cookies from uh, the other side the from an, uh, from a different website so that now if an advertiser leaves a cookie on your phone that was doing that tracking before that saw you traveling from one site to another they can no longer do that and there was huge outrage from the advertising industry because this will limit greatly an amount of information that they can collect and also the amount of money they can make off of you as you're using the internet. Um, the open letter, um, if I can just read a little yeah. bit of a blurb from it, is um, it's pretty good. Uh, it's from all of the the big um, advertisement companies, the American Association of Advertising, Data and Marketing Association, um, the American Advertising Federation, to name a few. They were saying, Apple's Safari move will hurt the user experience and sabotage the economic model for the internet. And it says their unilateral and heavy handed approach is bad for consumer choice and bad for the ad supported online content and consumers that, and services consumers love. It's because everybody loves those ads that follow you across oh, the yeah. screen or like, suggest creepy that's, stuff that, that you were looking yeah. at like weeks that's, ago. That, that's the reason I browse the internet all the time is to see all the great ads all over that. Yeah. 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 And it's and then my favorite <laughs> line. Um, Blocking cookies in this manner will drive a wedge between brands and their consumers, and it will make advertising more generic and less timely and useful, which is like, oh, no, ads are going to be reduced to just a banner on the side of the web page. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like they, they're like they not understanding what people actually want with ads. Their argument is that they were using these to personal ads, personal, personalize ads. Uh, I can't talk today so that um you you see more relevant things so that they you're you'll be more likely to click on it um since it knows that hey you were looking at um i don't know thompson you were looking at lenses on amazon <laughs> hey here's all the lenses what? that you were looking at right <laughs> oh no you yeah. wouldn't do that right you you weren't looking at lenses earlier <laughs> today <laughs> yeah um, not at all not me <laughs> So what are you guys' thoughts on, on this and this move? Do you think it's too heavy on, on Safari or Apple's part, or it's prob is it the right thing to uh, do? I, I think no. Apple, is personally, that they're stepping in and they're going, oh, we already have this, this ad-based infrastructure that's pre-built. They're based on, uh, like, they're based to track cookies. Well, now we'll just make it so our browser specifically blocks them from accessing these cookies. We have total control of that, and now we can charge these advertisers on the back end to have a subscription fee to our database. Mm. And they're gonna have, they're gonna market it like, oh well, we're consumer friendly. We're just trying to protect the consumer, not guide them into you know purchases because these these cookies are just displaying all their personal searches and information, you know. But it really, you know, you can market it that way. Apple's pretty good at marketing. Oh, we're all about protecting the consumer, but it seems like oh, we're we're gonna set up a massive subscription fee on the back end, and all these ad you know agencies are gonna have to pay us a premium. I wouldn't be surprised with the current outrage from those ad agencies if that comes out. You know what I mean? If right. they go, oh, well, look, this is what they did. So you, you might think that they're helping you out, but this is what they're really doing. And um, I, it, but I look at it on the reverse end, like, oh, no, you mean websites have to pay for advertising like TV stations <laughs> do or billboards do? Like, hey, this is our demographic for people who visit this. Let's figure out what we should buy, hoping that they'll click on it instead of just going, hey, we're just going to see what they like and just give them that advertising consumer choice well i don't have a choice when you see everything i do and then figure out mm -hmm. what you should give me an ad for it's, you know what i mean it's kind of yeah yeah and, and that, that's like exactly what they were saying and they reiterated it stance that users feel that the trust is broken when their web activity is tracked online and sold for purposes they didn't agree to so they're like that they're taking that exact stance so i i, I can see um the potential for an infrastructure of subscription-based advertising set up on the back end. And I agree with you there, but I feel like this overall is a better move because this kind of coupled with Google's um, a, like alignment with the coalition for better ads that we talked about on previous episodes, I think these yeah. kind of go hand in hand. And um, as ads get less invasive, they may roll back these update, these like features to kind of be like, okay, 
if you're going to get a little too heavy handed with yours, we're going to increase our restrictions on our end to make sure that the consumers are still treated fairly in the end. I mean, I, I it could go either way, but I, I, I just think that that uh, open letter from the ad industry is just too good. Like they had to come out with some like generic response. <laughs> And they're worried yeah, because, yeah, they're worried because, um, in the in North America, Safari accounts for little under half of all mobile web traffic. Half mm -hmm. of all crazy. mobile. Wouldn't think yeah, that. yeah. Um, that's is that mobile Safari or just in general? That uh, Safari in general, but you know how many Mac users there are. Not that much. Yeah. So like, it's mobile Safari major, uh, the majority of that. Um, Actually, they specify half of all mobile web traffic accounts for Safari. So yeah, it is mobile Safari. Yeah. Um, globally, that is that number is a little dwarfed, but you know where all the money is, right? In North America, the U.S. consumer they spend a lot of money, so that's where all the advertisement going. So that's why these advertisers are freaking out. Um, and historically, that iOS adoption has been uh, fairly high um, in terms of getting the newest version on there. So that. Uh, they know that iOS 11 will be on a majority of Apple phones within about a month or so um, on, yeah, within North America. So they're worried that, yeah, more more people will be downloading iOS 11 and now they're going to lose all this information, the tracking information. Yeah. They're probably just lashing out because, like I was saying earlier, with that Coalition for Better Ads, you've got Chrome kind of dropping a lot of these heavy enforcements on, on that. And then now Apple comes out with their own method and they're hitting them from something that even what the coalition for better ads didn't cover, which was cookies. And that, again, I don't know if you guys remember the super cookie that Verizon made um, a few yeah. years ago wow. to, to track users. They, um, they got in a lot of trouble with the, with the FCC back. Um, it was, this was a very long time ago, um, probably over five or six years ago. And, um, they had a super, no, this was, this was more recent than that. This was before, um, Obama in introduced the, um, the right to kind of opt out of, or for like title two classification of broadband, okay. um, Verizon had a super cookie that basically would collect information coming out of your network. So not only what your computer was doing, but anything coming into or out of your network, Verizon knew what what it was and was serving you ads and um tracking your user data based on that cookie um and this is kind of the advertisers the closest thing they can get to a super cookie one of those types of um, trackers that follows you from site to site and i mean i could even see it in some cases where the impact on advertising companies is relatively minimal where i know a lot of older people, older generations who use um, just any kind of standard internet experience, they float between probably Facebook, Amazon, and Google, like just Google searches and like Wikipedia and like, that's it. Like most people's entire internet is Facebook or like whatever email provider they use in some cases. So yeah, I mean, like it's, I mean, it, we talk about with the cookies and all and advertising based, I mean. How Facebook and Facebook Messenger were were pretty famous for turning on your microphone remotely, listening to your conversations, and giving you advertisements based on that. Mm -hmm. Like there were so many horror stories of people like, "Oh, my daughter said that uh, one of her friends got engaged," and then all of a sudden they they see engagement ring ads on their Facebook, and that's it. It's like, well, hold on, it's like, yeah. I mean, there's. I know we're getting a little off topic here, like a little tangent, but like, what? Like you said, it might not be that big of a hit to them. I mean, they have their ways. They have so many different ways to get this information and profit off of it. I mean, yeah, they'll find another way. Yeah, we can feel bad for the ad companies all we want, but they'll find a way. They'll survive. Yeah. <laughs> if, Exper if Experian can survive, then I think these ad companies <laughs> can survive. <laughs> so, but um, to not so cleanly move into the Experian topics, though, <laughs> <laughs> um, we have um been looking into a lot of the stuff that's been coming out around the Experian hack and just how they've been handling it and might I say these people are really giving Uber a run for their money in terms of how bad you can manage a company in the short spirit in, in such a short period of time um 
we have a few articles that are linked and we can just kind of talk in general about Xperia and again, just because this is um, Xperia, just because this is as important of a topic as we said it was in the previous episode. But um, they apparently, um, according to this uh, Krebs on security, uh, just blog post, um, apparently anybody can get your credit freeze pin, the timestamp that you were mentioning, Urban. Um, yeah. Apparently anybody can get this, can request this pin. Do you want to go into this a little bit? I know you're the one who suggested this article. Yeah. So this isn't directly related. Well, not, it's not, doesn't involve Equifax directly, but um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Experian. Experian uh, offers uh, right. credit, yeah. uh, credit monitoring um, in general for your credit. So you can sign up with Experian and uh, some people have, um, uh, you know, put a freeze on their credit uh, recently because of this uh, Equifax uh, hack. Um, and uh, the Experian website uh, allows you to retrieve that cred credit freeze pin um, fairly easily without with knowing just a little bit of information um, about the person and you, that the social security number I think is not one of those one of that information so you can fairly easily if you know their name um, address um, the last known address it doesn't have have to has to be even the current one the last known address um, of the person you can retrieve um, this uh, social security pin. number is on there by the way I'm oh surprised. this social security number which now has leaked so yeah it's public yes yeah, uh, yeah, right exactly. so um, it's not that hard for people to uh, find that but you all that that's all you need for you for the someone to obtain this pin and this pin will allow um, if you put a freeze on your credit this pin will allow someone to, let's say, get a credit card on your name, even with that freeze in effect. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, to kind of expand on what we were just talking about, the security, there's uh, questions that were asked. Um, the article has them listed uh, a little further down yep. in the article, like a sample set that one reader was asked by the site. There was something, it wasn't even involving your social security number. It was, please select the city you previously lived in. According to our records, you lived in this place. Please choose the city from the following list where the street is located. Um, which of the following people live or previously lived with you at the address you provided? And select the model year of your vehicle you purchased prior to July 2017. All of these you could find out literally by driving past someone's home. <laughs> like, you could find this out just from knowing the person and going past their yeah, house. Yeah, and, and their address leaked, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you have the address, so you know it's right. Oh, man. <laughs> It's yeah, so you can use this pin to unlock or, or, or um, bypass that freeze that you put on there to protect your account. Uh, so, yeah, you, someone can sign up, they can still sign up to get a credit card in your name or get a loan in your name uh, just mm -hmm. by having your, just even though you have a freeze on your credit. Um, so it's not just Experian that, that doesn't know how to do proper security. Uh, Experian uh, doesn't either when they're in their entire business is monitoring and protecting quote unquote protecting your credit so it's um, two down now we just have transunion left <laughs> um yeah I, I don't have high so, hopes for the other two either yeah so so j just to counter um it, what what else could you really ask for do you think would it be like you would have to create an account with a password would it, like what else could you really i mean i know all that information leaked but what is the alternative? What else can you ask for besides personal information? Yeah, there's. it's in one of those situations where you can only... I mean, there's there's some of these where um, you could eliminate this process entirely. Like, um, I was going to do a, uh, a fraud alert detection from TransUnion, and I think I misanswered one of the questions because I didn't have the paperwork on me, and I just kind of took a guess. And... If it locks you out of that, then you have to mail in like proof of your residency, um, your name on the several bills, photo ID, passport, all that stuff. And I honestly think just totally removing these online solutions and just making everyone do it that way, it yeah. generates more paperwork on their end, but it increases the burden to get into someone's account by so much more. Yeah, good point. 
that was at the point for me where I was just like, screw this. I'm just going to go monitor my credit score <laughs> and just make yeah. sure that it's not plummeting <laughs> at this point. It was like, I, I don't have the time to do this. And I'm one out of 143 million people who could have been impacted because we can't even check on their site because it's just returning random results. Or in the case of this other, this tweet from the white hat hacker, it's, it's they're completely Equifax is um, completely linking to phishing sites instead of actual, um, instead of the actual site that the site that they set up to help people. So they can't even keep that under control. Like um, I know it's in the, the show notes, but Nick Sweeting uh, created an identical version of the website of the just the site that you could go to to double check and it was a complete bogus phishing site and the equifax twitter account linked to the phishing site instead of their actual site so this is another mistake chalked up on the board of equifax we should really have like behind one of us like a counter <laughs> with like paper you can rip off or it's like days since an equifax grew up or like right next to the days since an uber screw up counter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, because man. um, I don't. This isn't in the show notes, but did you guys hear about the news that came out about Equifax's chief security officer? No. This is something that I found to be absolutely just a treasure to hear from this company. This was so reassuring. They're um, they're currently actively scrubbing all information about this person from social media. Uh, their CSO. And she has recently retired right after the breach came out. Um, and sure. the reason why they're scrubbing all of her information from social media is because, as it turns out, she has a degree in music appreciation or a degree in music in general. And she has no practical knowledge of security in any way. Like, no one can find any proof of her ever practicing any kind of formal internet security. And it just seems like they just completely hired a joker for this role, like someone who just has absolutely no idea what they're doing. Well, that, nice. I, now that explains everything. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Mystery yeah. solved. Everyone Wait, they, they who couldn't was find any certifications or anything? They Nothing couldn't find anything on this person. And, and, and even if they could, then why are they scrubbing her information from all social media? Like she's disappearing yeah, from they, Twitter, disappearing from like Facebook. She's just vanishing from social media. And it's all fueled by Equifax. Like they're trying to your, your chief security officer doesn't know anything about security. <laughs> oh Especially God. when that security involves more than half of America's social security numbers. No, you the, would think everyone, that you would look. It's, every, that? it's everyone in America. Only half of it got leaked. But yeah, yes, yeah. it's everyone in America. They have access to every single person's uh, social security number. You would think S that a somebody would like, a favor. Yeah. Yeah, then I, I wonder what her, like, golden uh, parachute was from this company, too, yeah, right. when she retired. Yeah. They're like, retire for publicity. We'll give you some money on the side. <laughs> and then we'll take care of your social media. Don't worry about yeah. it. And then people are like, wait, hold on. What is this person? What did she do in college? What ha Wait, where is her evidence of being an actual security off? Like, it's CSO? <laughs> like, how is she qualified for this role? It's like, like making a film major uh, a programmer, man. No, you can't do that. I would never. Do I wouldn't. They gotta stick to podcasting where they belong. <laughs> you guys, uh, you guys checked out of any any of uh, Nick Sweeting's other tweets since that since this whole incident where they tweeted out his link. No, I think I like the, the most recent one. He said the best headline so far is from at SFGate. They said <laughs> Equifax, not the master of its domain. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, man. <laughs> And Perfect. Equifax has since deleted that tweet too. So yeah. we can, we'll have the tweet from Nick Sweeting in the, the show notes, but the, the tweet that was linked by him from Equifax was since deleted. So if, if you go on his page at the moment, the second tweet down um, is uh, somebody screenshotted his tweet and then the Equifax tweet. So thank you. It, it lives on through screenshots. Yep. Just like and it, apparently, just like yeah. Apparently, they tweeted it over eight times. On only some of them were <laughs> eight times. They the Equifax oh, Twitter account man. tweeted that bad link. Like it's um, not funny, but it's like, it's like how 
<laughs> How much worse can you I make? I mean, like, this? is it not funny though? Because at this point, when you have this much personal a personally identifiable information leaked, and the only thing we can literally tell people to do is either sign up for a fraud alert for ninety days to monitor your account, freeze your entire credit report polls, or just watch your credit score for like basically the remainder of your natural life, like. Can we not have a laugh about this? <laughs> because of just how much yeah, it is. <laughs> like, it's one of the things where it's like, oh, there's a workaround, a software update will fix it. But it's another thing where it's like, you know that number, the, the one you only get one of? Like, yeah, someone else has it now. Yeah, you know the one that's super, like, only only for you and literally identifies you for the rest of your entire <laughs> life for everything you've ever done and ever will do? It's, like, almost as good Everybody as, has that like, now. if not better than, like, your actual fingerprint or, like, your retina. You know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll laugh about this, and wh hopefully, this company just burns to the ground. And there's people that are calling for this company to be shut down, which I am 100% yeah. behind. And yeah, right, rightfully so. Yeah. Yeah. There's a New York Times article. Um, it's an opinion-based poll to, or opinion-based article to, just saying get rid of Equifax. Like they've and I would obviously put the shown rest of them in there as well. I, that? I would put the rest of them in, in there as well. Not just Equifax. There has to be some kind of rework on the way that we, who we trust this information with. Because if Equifax was this bad, I don't, I, I have no faith in the other two um, at this yeah. point. Of this. I think, yeah, either do it through TransUnion or bus. Like, I think that's your only bet at this at this point. If you're gonna if you're gonna be in contact with any of them, only because they're they have a better history than the other two, and I'm still giving them the benefit of the doubt in that they may have taken their due diligence. But yeah, I, so, I, 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 well, it's gone. Even if this company collapses, is they're just gonna transfer all the data to like another company, right? That's probably even less secure. Let's face it. <laughs> yeah, it probably could. The CEO will move on. He'll still be making plenty of money, but. I so, thought I saw some financial analysts looking into this and they were saying that Equifax may suffer a 10% hit to their, to their revenue and to their, um, like net, like their net worth or their assets. And that's all that would be yeah. it. And they, they could recover. Wow. So wow. That's, crazy. that's like hardly even a lessons learned. <laughs> and, it shows you how bad the creditors and lenders rely on them. Yeah. And uh, they, prop hopefully, them up. they keep them alive. Yeah. And, uh, Kyle, I know you were talking about on the last episode that none of the news organizations were actually covering this, but this opinion-based poll was published on New York Times. So yeah. now it's starting to get some traction. And I mean, we do have all of these crazy hurricanes that are going on uh, in, in the Caribbean area and in Mexico and all the earthquakes. And like, while we're not detracting from the newsworthiness and the attention that should get because it's a na it's a crisis on a national scale for multi for multiple countries this is still important as well and i think it should be covered when they're done talking about that <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny i i actually clicked on that new york times article and uh, one of the things i i saw is that uh well, the only reason that brian you said that people might be less secure they might be more secure because this is the oldest of the big credit re uh, reporting bureaus which i didn't know uh, Equifax, that's the oldest one. Um, funny story. So they they said that they got their start as a private investigator <laughs> in the late 1800s. So a business would ask them about a customer and be like, hey, go dig up some dirt. And then they would sell it, sell it to the bank or the, the business. And that's basically <laughs> what they do now for... for I'm just picturing some dude in a trench coat with the Equifax logo. Yeah, like, me too. <laughs> just like... He's like, I'm on it. I'm on the case. Like at the end of a long table in a bar with like a huge pipe. <laughs> oh, not, man. not to go off tangent, but is anybody else getting robot on Matt? Or is it just me? Am I robot? Uh, Am I still I robot? On my end. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Might just be me then. Just want to double check. Sorry. No, you're good. That's fine. As we we all we all appreciate robots on this show. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I mean like at this point. It's like, I want to tell people to, like, I, I want to be able to have an answer where I want to be able to say, do this to mitigate your issues. But with Equifax and now Experian kind of showing that they're not in that, like, they're not, like, what happens, what would happen if Experian was targeted instead of Equifax? What would happen if TransUnion was targeted instead of either one? Would it be worse? Would it be better? 
we don't know. We just kind of go off the benefit of the doubt that this like mysterious super company is just going to keep all of our information safe and that they're going to survive anyway. But I mean, we can always do the standard of uh, talking to your congressman or your local senator or something and kind of letting them know um, if there's any bills that are currently being put through um, to kind of let them know that you support those bills. Because I'd imagine that there'd be several bills at least introduced by smaller um, pocket like lobbies and groups um, through any kind of Senate organization. So I'd imagine that's probably the best way to do it. But um, I don't know if any of you guys have any um, additional remarks or things that you might have learned on the side about Equifax. In between. Yeah, got no, same between last week and, th and this week. Yeah, I mean, I didn't learn much more, but just to reinforce what you said, I mean, just like a lot of things, the more the more the consumer, the more we talk about it, the more people, politicians, media will have to talk about it. When it's the buzz thing that's going on in the world, people will cover it. People will start paying attention. So right. if you want to make a difference, you have to go old school. Reach out to your local congressman person, your, your senators, whoever you have to, and, and let's start making changes, man. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm actually thinking about my personal experience, one thing somebody could do is go on to those three credit bureaus and just mess up their uh, fraud detection or like signing up for a credit free. So that way it does force them to send in all that documentation. So that way, not only do they have to have your info, but they have to intercept your mail in order to like unfreeze or freeze a credit report check. Just go in and sign up and just mess up a question. Just screw it up. <laughs> Let's see what it does. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, TransUnion and Experian have both locked me out because I got the same question wrong twice. <laughs> but um, that being said, I think that covers it for our first half unless I might've missed anything. Anybody have any last remarks before we take a short break? I'm sure there's a be more news of Equifax. I, this isn't the end of it. Um, yeah. I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if more like crazy stuff um, comes out. And I, I look forward to some kind of change happening uh, from either the government putting out a bill right. that, that restricts or enforces a certain level of security that these companies have to follow and that the responsibility that they have for protecting this information is is vital um mm -hmm. and it's just ridiculous that they have been going by just this and hiring someone who had, uh, doesn't have the right credentials the right expertise to even lead a team to secure this information important data is just and we'll be sure to definitely cover it too. Yes, yes. We'll yeah. keep you guys up to date. Anything that we find out, uh, we'll let you guys know for sure. Mm -hmm. And and for anybody who may be thinking, oh, like beating a dead horse or this yeah. gets old, like it's tech when it comes down to it. When, when you break it down to its core values, it's how do we secure personally identifiable information in an age where it's so easy to hack into somebody's account or when you have these corporations who aren't held accountable to any large degree on the responsibility they hold for this information. So, but with that being said, I think it is time for a short break. So thank you for listening to the first half of episode 20 and we'll see you guys in the second half. Take it easy guys. Everybody, welcome back. Episode 20, Industry 4.0. Thanks for coming back for the second half. We hope you enjoyed those beats from Jay Buds. He couldn't be with us, but the rest of the squad's still here, ready to bring you some, you know, some interesting things in the second half. Make sure that however you guys are, are watching us, listening to us, whatever the, the deal may be, make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing. Anybody who gives us a rated review, regardless of how many stars, as long as I can access it and you're not private or anything like that, I will give you a shout out, a shout out on the pod. You'll get a little shout out on the uh, on the Twitch or the YouTube feeds. 
Um, speaking of Twitch and YouTube, obviously you can find us here on Twitch. We're live right now as we're doing this. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube if you go, if you search Industry 4.0. Uh, we're also on iTunes and Google Play by searching Industry 4.0. Uh, we are on uh, Twitter, pretty active Twitter account. We do a couple different feeds. It's uh, at Industry 4.0, all spelled out, so F-O-U-R-O-H. Spelled just like that uh, as well for, uh, like I said, Twitch. Twitch.com is Industry 4.0, all spelled out if you can't find us through the search. Uh, and then Facebook.com slash Industry 4.0, which you can also watch our feeds through now, uh, thanks to some tech-savvy awesomeness from Mr. Matt Slavin. Um, all that being said, when you're looking for us, please check for the white symbol with the industry 4.0 and the black and green gears. Um, I mean, you know, just make sure you love us and we'll love you back. Uh, that being said, let's get kicking off into something fun, something we kind of referenced last week and then Irvin shared with us uh, some, some exciting news about a new startup, Pi. So it's a new startup company working on wireless charging. We talked about how uh, the new iPhone, iPhone 10 that is being released, uh, is finally introducing wireless charging for Apple. Obviously, Samsung having it in the past. And I, I commented on, if you listened to last week's show, uh, about how it's it's wireless, but is it really? It's, you know, now instead of carrying one little cord around, I just look fancier because now I carry this big bulky platform that doesn't really fit in my pocket and I get to, ooh, it stands up instead of sitting on the table. Well, Pi, their goal is to have true wireless charging where just laying your phone near their device will give you wireless charging. And it's it, it's it's funny because you shared that article, Irv, and right after I it, of course my head starts spinning right away with what are the what are the future uses? Once this becomes more, you know, right now they said about a foot away from the device. As this expands, as this technology gets better. What are the possibilities? What can we see? And me being the big sports fan that I am, I also work down at the stadiums. I happen to see a charging station at Citizens Bank Park where it's just a bunch of cords sticking out of the center of this table. And then like two sections over, I saw just a stand-up table for people standing in standing room only sections to put their food down and still get a sight of the game. And then we also talked about in previous episodes where MLB.com is trying to integrate their like live stats and like the television broadcast while you're live at the game. Well, imagine if you take that charging station where all you have to do is be next to it instead of being plugged in and the cords only so long. And I, I, I think you really could selfishly from a sports aspect, mm -hmm. you have so many options with just that small section, just that small one foot, two foot area that they currently have. I mean, I, I, I clearly I'm excited about it. I don't know. What do you think this guy's means for, what do you think, this means for the future of the the wireless charging game um i can jump in if it gets efficient enough i could see um i know we were talking about like the ar kit and everything that apple has and google is now working on to get augmented reality and if we can get this um to the point where it's power efficient enough to be able to charge the phone while it's performing any kind of strenuous task you could get those live stats while your phone is charging so it could minimize the downsides of a huge battery hit of running this like heavy AR software for your phone. So I could see that being one of the immediate benefits to kind of tie that into what you were talking about with being in a sports stadium instead of having to run a cable all the way from a table or having to lay your phone down on the table to charge and not be able to use any of those functions while it's laying on the ground. Um, but this has some serious potential to really kind of change the way um, people look at phones. And when you get this kind of technology perfected, it could even change the design of phones as well, since we would no longer even need ports in that way. And yes, I know Apple and Johnny Ive want to get rid of as many ports as possible. So this kind yeah. of lends to their future. Yeah, it sure seems like that. They removed the headphone jack, and now I think they're 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 looking forward to where to a future where they can remove that lightning port as well. Um, but I, this is a very very interesting technology because we've seen like tech demos of true wireless charger where you just bring in a device into a room and it just starts charging. But this works off the existing Qi standard that now the new iPhones are using and the and some Android phones have been using for a while. So you don't need any special hardware uh, for your device if you're if that device already supports that Qi standard. 
uh, which is very interesting. You don't need to have a special, perhaps bulky case put onto your phone. All you need to do is just have one that already has that wireless charging capability, bring it within a feet of this device and it charges. That's, that's awesome for the adoption because no one wants to buy like a big bulky case that'll add this feature on. If it's already built in the phone, then you're more likely to uh, start using it. Right. I do have and some concerns about like, I don't know, health stuff or affecting we don't know like if we start expanding past that foot or 12 inch range right what mm -hmm. could be effect on the human body let's say if someone has a pacemaker um, built in would that affect the the function of that pacemaker put their heart out of rhythm again we don't know we have got to be careful right. with those type of risks um, um. Yeah. To kind of go off of what you're saying, I'm reading the, I, I clicked on one of the links in the article to their website, their to pycharging.com. And they do mention this magnetic field that um, is generated by this technology. And it says it's um, our patented platform allows Pi to change the angle of the magnetic field to perfectly match the angle of the device, which means no more charging pads. And it says, it can charge up to four phones at full speed or even more devices at reduced speed if they're moving. And it follows existing FCC safety guidelines, which is the important thing to note. Nice. So it says the result is safe, seamless power. So um, it's they're claiming it's using a weak magnetic field, but I would like to see this in like a, a chamber and like see how this works on pacemakers. And I'm sure they've tested this extensively if... Um, if their technology is as advanced as they claim it is, um, and we'd have to just see um, what what they are able to produce. But um, it looks like they're going to be selling it, according to this article, on, for more for less than two hundred dollars. Yeah, they said well under two hundred. They yeah. haven't set an exact price date, um, and then you can uh, reserve one now. And the first mm -hmm. three hundred fourteen people uh, that reserve it will get a fifty dollar nice. discount. Um, the, yeah, the that, first Pi amount just, of customers to purchase yeah. a Pi charger. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. It's a nice the, little um, nod. Yeah, nice little shout out to all us nerds. Mm -hmm. Um, oh. the uh, what were you saying about? Like, I I thought it was really cool that they uh, they tested it moving. It stayed charging. It didn't mm -hmm. matter what direction the phone was facing. It still yeah. charged perfectly fine. Um, apparently they showed off with like they had one phone. And then brought two more phones in and there was no no delay they instantly started charging when it got within that 12 feet and then they brought in one of the bigger ipads and the same effect happened it didn't slow it down because it was a larger device um which excites me as well they said that their goal is that uh or well they said like with our current technology it's theoretically possible to increase the the power by putting in components with higher power ratings and uh, could potentially charge laptops the same way, uh, which would be really, really cool, especially for my laptop that, uh, you know, can't be unplugged or it dies in 13 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it could get up to the point of charging Teslas? <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, that, that, that's going to be need a lot of them if it's only a 12 foot radius. We're going right. to uh, you're gonna start, have to start investing in Pi right now. They're going to be bought up if that's the case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wouldn't be surprised these guys are bought on. Looks like they're really on. Looks like they're really yeah. on to something with this. Yeah, on the definitely. ground floor, boys. Yeah, absolutely. So my question is, I guess, like, what what would it do to the battery? Is there going to be extreme degradation when you're constantly you're walking into a room and is your your phone's charging? You walk out, it's mm -hmm. not charging. Back right. in, it's charging again. Back yeah. out, it's not charging again. We've you been know, just... we've been taught that hey, you gotta charge it full, let it drain all the way. That's the health to keep the battery healthy. If you're walking into these rooms that have this ability and you just charge it every single time that you walk into that room or you go from one place to another, your phone is pretty yeah. much always charging. How does that affect the life of the battery? Um, yeah. that's and, interesting. And I think that's when you would have to look at like potentially limiting the range. So yeah, would it be really cool to have a whole room like that? Yeah. But just like you said, if we're abusing battery life like that and people's batteries are degrading at such a high rate, you know, in a room you could have that one table or that one, corner couch or whatever has it built in mm -hmm. so if you're on the couch or if you're at that table yeah it'll it'll charge if you're away from a piece of do something in that room i think that's where you start to get into like just 
companies picking and choosing like, you know, as, is this something that I want to do or do I want to be, you know, do I want to make consumer friendly or do I want to make more money? You know, one of those deals. So I could even see something along those lines where if this does become as well adopted as people would hope that it would be, um, because like you guys are saying 12, 12 foot radius, that's almost like the full size of my bedroom. I'd have to like hide in the corner yeah, of the room. 12, in order for it's 12 it. inches. Yeah, right now it's only 12 inches. 12 inches. <laughs> okay. At least it's 12 feet at first, but I might have misheard that. Yeah. But um, so I, I could see this getting to the point where maybe by software, they could cap the battery charging via Qi to 80% maybe or something like that to minimize damage to the, the battery. Whereas um, if you wanted to cap it up all the way to 100%, you'd have to put it on the plug or lay it on um, like a close, like a contacted Qi charger kind of mm -hmm. solution. But um. I don't know if you know there's a way to differentiate that, but I, the only way I could see that it would be capping the battery because with the way that lithium batteries are nowadays, that the battery technology is way further behind the charging technology. So that's one thing. I might have to reserve this thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> $50 off. Why not? And then you're going to get the $50 Mophie case unless you upgrade to the eight. Yeah. Then you don't have to worry true. about it. Yeah, actually. But yeah, I mean, if you want to be the first guinea pig to test this and, Go for it. <laughs> You're gonna come back with Maybe like I will. Um, Maybe I will. Well, a regular heartbeat. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna come back with a with a, a regular heartbeat and a pie hat and a pie shirt for Yeah. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> I like that. I bought in guys. <laughs> gonna be looking at your camera and we'll just see like this weird wave of the magnetic field distorting your <laughs> your microphone and camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of glowing. Yeah. I'm charging my phone, guys. <laughs> I'm charging my phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but I, I I do think this technology does have potential. And I, I want to say this company will probably get bought by a larger company. Because that's kind of like the end goal with all these types of companies, right? To get purchased by one of the yeah. big guys and cash out kind of a deal. But Yeah, fight it as long as you can build as much equity as you can and then sell when you're peak. Yeah. But um, if you guys... Uh, wanted to we got some google leaks we can also talk about as well um not to yeah. segue from that but um I don't, there's there, there's no news on on chi charging from google unfortunately so we don't know if they're going to be keeping up with the standard but we do have news of so, some breaking news of the new pixels that came out this past week um i believe among the leaks were the price points on the pixel xl the two models that are going to be released um the first one this is just the XL, so this is the, the larger and more expensive version of the two. So the they're going to come in at 64 gigabytes and 128 gigabytes. And the 64 gigabyte is going to start at, I believe the number was $849. Um, Irvin, do you know the price of the 128 off the top of your head? I can't. 128, I uh, it's uh, 949. 949, so another $100. Yeah, $100 more. Yeah. Yeah, so... Fairly expensive phones, and it looks like um, we are moving towards that type of a market where flagships just continue to increase in price. And it's at the point now where it's competing with decent laptops in terms of the cost that you're paying for a new smartphone. But they look nice. Um, I will so, give them that much. Yeah, the Excel, the Excel one is going to be made by LG. Is mm -hmm. That's what the rumors are saying. Um, yeah. last year it was, we were talking earlier in the episode, the HTC a pixel, the original pixel, uh, was made by HTC and that includes both the regular version and the Excel. And it looks like Google's mixing it up a little bit. The Excel is going to be made by LG. And then there was another leak about the regular, uh, pixel two that is apparently is going to stick with, uh, HTC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it looks like they, they may have a form, like a, a similar uh, form factor in terms of build. Like they yes. may be working closely together yeah. in maintaining a similar look, kind of how the original Pixel had. But I, I kind of like it. The, the If anybody who's seen a photo of a, of a Pixel before, it's the glass has been, in, has been decreased on the back of the phone to about the top quarter of the device. And... I was looking at the the names of the colors for these, and that panda looking one that they mm -hmm. referred to is it's called black and white, yeah. the most boring name for <laughs> colors ever on phones. Yeah. Um, it it looks really nice. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. It's literally just called black and white. Yeah. With that there's interesting, no uh, if you guys are watching the video version of this, there's an interesting, the power button is colored orange on these, yeah. on yeah. these leaks that might not make it to the final version. Uh, we'll see. I'll, I think we all should, should uh, preface all this by staying. I don't think we, this was a known the, our last episode, but Google officially announced that they're having an event uh, October no, 4th. Really. Octo October 4th, um, they didn't say what they're going to announce, but they said that they're going to launch uh, some new stuff on October 4th. And these leaks are what people think are going to be uh, launched at that event. So yeah. in, in two weeks. Yeah, that's, that's probably a safe assumption. Yeah. But back so, to these colors for a yeah. second. <laughs> you got, you got, so you got just, you have black and white, mm -hmm. then you have just black. Yeah, that's the other yeah. color. That's, mm -hmm. and that's what it's called? Yeah, yeah, it's called Just Black. And then yeah. <laughs> there's a third color that was rumored that's going... I think it's going to be called Almost Blue. No, Kind of Blue. Kind of Blue. For the, what, what is it? Uh, for the regular Pixel 2, not the XL. The one of the rumored oh, colors. Kind of Blue. Kind of Blue. <laughs> <laughs> like turquoise? Even yeah. better. Kind of Blue. That's and, like... um. Yeah. That's like the... It's kind of a... Uh, like a callback to the original colors on the Pixel phones, which was um, quite black, um, very silver, and really blue. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like them making fun of, like, the weird, like, artsy names that companies not calling yeah. out any particular yeah. phone man manufacturer and in particular, like, Space Gray, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Unfortunately, no, I, I do... Yeah. Huh? Yeah, unfortunately, there's a, a bad part of this rumor that I'm not a huge fan of. There are, it looks like they're going to be removing the headphone jack in these yep. uh, new pixels, which I, I don't see any reasons to do that at all. They explicitly made fun of Apple during the keynote yeah. for the original pixel saying that the headphone jack's like shockingly familiar or something like that, <laughs> or like surprisingly <laughs> not new or something like that. Like they 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 explicitly trolled them, and now they're like, yeah, no headphone jack is whatever. But um, to kind of go off of that, maybe the removal of the headphone jack is to pave the way for their new Bistro headphones that they're going to be mm -hmm. coming out with, and all the new assistant-enabled Bluetooth earbuds and headphones that are rumored to be released. Um, we I don't think we explicitly mentioned any of that in the show notes, but no. I think this push to move the assistant into the headphones is going to be something that they're going to try for. And maybe this kind of helps them move that along faster. It'll be yeah. harder to embed the assistant in something that doesn't need to charge, you know? Mm -hmm. Has there been any rumor of um, them partnering with any major audio manufacturers for those? Yeah, so um, actually well, yes. Bose uh, announced <laughs> today, made it official that they're going to uh, launch their Bose QC35 uh, with Google's assistant built in. So they have a, you have a button that you can just press and, and launch Google Assistant. You can talk to it. It works both for iPhone and Android, uh, which is nice. So you don't need an Android phone. So if you're an iOS user and you're tired of using Siri and Siri not giving you the answers that you want, uh, you can switch to Google Assistant and press that button and get some useful features out of her, um, which is really nice. And there's a rumor that they're going to release Google is going to make their own hardware that'll uh, mimic this type of features that the AirPods do for Apple uh, today well, what's going to build in um, the features of Google Assistant it's going to be truly wireless uh, headphones so that means each earbud will be on its own um, and I'm, I'm very excited about those and, and see what they bring I yeah so bad yeah <laughs> <laughs> I want them. Yeah, but um, I want I want the assistant built into my ear. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, okay with that. Because yeah. I I'm using it more and more now because I'm like I'll use it to send messages. I'll use it to call. I'll use it for just like really like tedious stuff that I just don't feel like using my hands for. Mm -hmm. Or like it's great for like when I'm like either out with like walking the dog or holding them some like groceries or something, and I need to like either respond to a message or like check something i can just not use my hand for it but um these uh these new leaks looks like it's a sign of google pushing its entire brand forward to like the next generation um because also there's up there's updates to 
their Chromebook line. Uh, there's rumored updates to, uh, what else was it there? There was rumors on the, the Google Home, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, there's daydream updates. It looks like they're taking everything they did and pushing it forward this, this year. Mm -hmm. So that's good because yeah. there's other companies who, who kind of are letting some of their existing technology kind of age. Can, can we talk about actually. this new Chromebook, the pixel book that they announced? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I but you're, I, I, you're pretty I, heated about it. <laughs> I, I may, maybe a little bit, but I, I would, I, so the rumored price for this pixel book is $1,200. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with Chromebooks, but all Chromebooks do. Well, be previously for a while, all they did was run, just run Chrome. And now they recently added the ability to run Android apps, which is great. And the majority, like the majority of these Chromebooks are, are around, I'd say on average three to $500 at the most. And they do pretty much everything that, that people want to do on a laptop. Majority, like majority of people just browse the internet, go on Facebook, check their email, right? They do all that great. But now Google is launching this Pixel book and they've launched other Pixel uh, laptops before and they were priced around this range. But this one is rumored to be around $1,200 starting price. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think most people are going to go jump out just to get a laptop that can run Chrome and run some Android apps. I don't, it does have the ability to fold into a tablet, which is like super big right yeah. now. So it's yeah. It's kind of like the dual purpose. And then but of course so they can, have a fancy hundred dollar pen, which of yeah. course people are all about. So, yeah. I mean, I could see it doing well, especially like if they're trying to brand everything pixel, if they're trying to keep that branding yeah. across, I mean, you know, do it with a splash, see what mm -hmm. happens. Yeah, but you can you can get a Samsung Chromebook that has a pen and also can fold into a tablet for five hundred dollars, right? Right, and I, I, I that right. <laughs> so it does, I'd say ninety percent of what this does for half the price, but more than half the price. So I don't. I think. Yeah, but like new. So <laughs> I think I'm sorry, Irvin. Um, I I only I demand that my Chromebooks have a 1080 Ti in them. Um, uh -huh. so <laughs> I'm I'm the biggest Google fanboy, and I love Chromebooks. I love the idea of them, but it's it's not for me personally. Maybe well, someone your name. Is looking for so <laughs> I don't think this is um like while I agree with you in that twelve hundred dollars for a Chromebook is kind of expensive. I don't think this is going to be a Chromebook in the traditional sense. One, we know almost nothing about this Chromebook, uh, except for that they may be updating it and the price uh, and the pen that they're going to be releasing with it. And it's and not two, called Chromebook anymore. Yeah, and it's called the Pixelbook. <laughs> two, the other thing that leads me to think that they're not targeting the standard Chromebook market with this is that... Um, on Apple Store, if you spec out a 12.9 inch iPad Pro um, for 512 gigabytes, we don't know the storage capacity of this Chromebook yet either. Um, that adds up to $1,100, $1,200, depending on what you get to, in, what do you add to it? So, I think that's what they're targeting here. I think this is their response to the iPad Pro. Mm -hmm. I think this is them right. breaking into that kind of a market and giving someone an opportunity to do this on software not supported by Apple or someone in the Android ecosystem. So, so you think that they're yeah, abandoning it, Android for, for the tablet OS and focusing making have, have Chrome OS as the tablet OS and then they also run Android apps so you can still have the best of both worlds? I, That's I, what I'm thinking. Yeah, it, it seems like they're trying to introduce the Chrome OS into the Ultrabook market, mm -hmm. right? And they're giving it. It's the Chrome. It's Chrome OS spec'd as a Studio Book, like mm -hmm. a kind of like a Wacom tablet with mm -hmm. all of the Google okay. Play Store built into it. Okay. I so, can, yeah. So Matt, so, you said that we don't know the uh, the storage. Actually, if you look at the article on yeah. the that we have in the show notes. They said that they have a 120 gigabyte version, a 256, and a 512. Okay. The 128 is the one that starts at 11.99. The 256 yeah. jumps to 13.99, and the 512 jumps to 17.49. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. First off, that's way too yeah. much money for even that. So I received yeah. everything that I said. But um, <laughs> that, that being said, um, I am wrong. 
first and foremost. But second off, yeah. the, the iPad Pro, the 512 gigabyte is 1150. But I would argue it's missing several features that Chrome OS has alongside Android when you combine the two. But I don't know. We don't. I, I just don't think we know. I, I want to see the demo. I want to see what right. it is. Usually, yeah. They're, they're going to have mission statements when they announce it. So, but I could see this being that type of an alternative, like a very powerful right. yeah. flip book, backlit key type thing target. Mm-hmm. And they're also claiming zero lag on that pen, yeah. which if they can do that, that's better than the iPad Pro to stand as it is. Yeah. Like a direct so, competitor to the um, the Microsoft Surface. Yeah, and the Surface basically line. Chrome OS, it provides everything that base Windows 10 had that they had on the Surface, except for maybe if they're going into the Adobe Creative Suite, if you're adding mm-hmm. Photoshop, like, right. you know, painting tools, stuff like that. that. That's what I would see used for the pen. I'd see maybe a UHD screen, like 3840 by something. That would, that would probably start to hit the price point they're asking for here. Well, they're claiming also, like I said, that zero lag. Imagine the refresh rate on that display as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's something that they're going to have to talk about. Yeah. And from this this leak picture, I mean, it looks like a one-inch bevel. So it better be a pretty, pretty high <laughs> fresh rate for a bevel like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I, it looks like a surface just because of the way the kickstand is on the back. Right. But um, I'm just kind of, I'm hesitant to... To write it off before it's released. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to see I, the actual release. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you cooled me down a little bit, Matt. I, I, I like the way that you framed it. That makes it a little bit more worth it to me. Yeah. Because I was just think like, they could bring something new that we haven't yeah. seen to a Chromebook, right? And change right. the way that you think about a Chromebook. Because right now, my idea of Chromebook is not meant for someone who's creating content, um, using yeah. it for actual work, getting uh, photo editing, video editing, all that. But maybe they're they're working towards changing that and they are bringing something new that we just don't know about. So That's a hot market. Yeah. Apple and Microsoft have already jumped into it. Google's still waiting. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking it'll be big. Mm-hmm. And um, also, if you look in that picture up above, you will see there is a headphone jack on that device. So, <laughs> I still have hopes. <laughs> so, um, um, and I think but, we have one more thing left. The Google Home Mini um, as was yeah. one of the leaks. So we talked about the Google Home. Both Matt and I are big fans of the uh, original Google Home. And now mm-hmm. it looks like they're going to release a mini version that's going to cost $50, $49 to be exact. Um, and you can uh, put a Google Home in every room of your house. I'll if probably you want. be first in line for one of these. <laughs> and they I have, they have, have been some waiting for style... a cheaper alternative yeah. to get the assistant in a different room. They have some stylish colors available, um, it looks like. Um, they're actually named some fun stuff, too. Yeah. I think the one's coral red. It's chalk, <laughs> charcoal, and coral. <laughs> yeah, it, it's well, great. So that they're bringing more, getting it easier for people to acquire Google Home. Because I mean, one hundred and twenty nine dollars was, I mean, fairly. St- you really have to make the decision of, hey, I want to get this into my home, and I want to uh, have something like this, a Google Assistant. But they needed something to compete with the Amazon. Was it the Tap? Not the tap. The Echo Dot. The Echo Dot. The Dot, yeah. Yeah, the Dot. Yeah. Um, I saw need... people on Black Friday last year buying them six at a time. Yeah. They were like using Dang. them as stocking, stocking stuffers uh, for sure because uh, they're mm-hmm. so cheap. Um, and these could be discounted by the time for Christmas around that price too. To have it um, more available. Can we also talk about how the fact that Google, within the span of maybe just over a year, has already caught up to like everything that the Echo does effectively and has mm-hmm. already passed it in some areas? Yeah, I totally had that. I saw I had them Google. They were gonna do that. I saw that from the beginning, but that's besides the point. But um, they look nice, and I'm very impressed with the leaks from Google. I may be a bit biased. But yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I know you guys love the home, but I think they should be giving them out for free from all the data collection they're using them for. Oh yeah, these yeah. things are, these things are data farms <laughs> that you're gonna put in your house. But yeah, I but they're fun data farms. 
Yeah. <laughs> fun. They tell you directions. Really you, cool. Then you call your family and Google listens in and everybody has a great time. <laughs> they laugh. We laugh. It's a great time. What I should do is somehow get my home to only listen when I talk to my girlfriend. So that way it can recommend gifts for me for her because I suck at shopping for her. So remind you when the birthday is. <laughs> no, see that I got. I just don't know whatever to get for it. So yeah. Oh, I got like, or like it listens and records everything they say. So when they say like, "Oh, get this for Christmas," it like automatically just dumps it into a like a, a list for you. Yeah, or yeah. it just it just goes to that website and drops it in the car. Like, see yep, people. It's already on the way, yeah. Shamelessly <laughs> monitoring everything everybody does is a good thing. <laughs> it bails out us boyfriends who aren't creative. Like, come on. <laughs> oh man. But I I think that um I think this is gonna be one of the defining keynotes for Google. They they claimed last year's was where they announced all the beginnings of this, but this is where you're really gonna start to see all these technologies evolve and like start to take the shape that Google is actually steering them in instead of just introducing a lot of new tech to the market at once. And I think that um, if they can get this home mini along with all the stuff in before the big holiday season and just in time to like drop the price for like Black Friday and all that stuff, I think you could see a lot of people jumping on this and adopting it. Because people like Google is a verb now. It's like, oh, just Google it. You know, yeah, like exactly. they don't say, oh, just Amazon it. Like it's not, it's not quite there yet, but. And this sort we'll of see. ties into what we were talking about at the beginning. They want to really do a big hardware push. They want to be the hardware manufacturer for sure. And mm -hmm. this, they're they're building all these devices um, themselves, or either partnering in this case with LG for the Excel this time um, to build something. But that's why they brought those people in house so that they can do everything. They don't have to partner with an outside company to manufacture something. They can right. just do it themselves, and that also, might lead to. Why, why didn't they do this back when they created the first Nexus? Yeah, it waited it's, a long time. I thought about that too. They could have done this yeah. way earlier, but I think they just they didn't. They waited too long. I thought that the Nexuses they were originally intended to be more of a development phone, not yes. necessarily intended yeah. to sell that well. Right, but they they were intended as a reference platform for android so with every release of android they were released at this development phone the nexus phones that were uh, uh, an example what google envisioned for a phone to use with that operating system and then right. they would hand out as just a suggestion to other phone manufacturers what they could implement uh, using the right. new features within each version of Android. But now I think their views are changing and they're like, hey guys, we should get into this manufacturing business because we see all these uh, manufacturers, like specifically Samsung, add adding all these crazy features. Like, let's say, let's put out a phone that we think should be the way that Android should be run. A pure version of it with a clean design, really good hardware. Um, that works seamlessly together and perhaps that can attract more customers towards their way um, that want that cleaner experience who are tired of all that cruft that other manufacturers are putting on top of uh, Android. Right. Um, I think now with the stock Android movement picking up momentum and, um, and we've even mentioned this in previous episodes about how uh, phones we're we're reaching peak smartphone in a way where there really isn't a whole lot more you can innovate on in terms of hardware or in terms of specs it's just kind of iterate up better software better hardware call it a day and improve the camera or improve the battery and like a minor tweaks to focus a phone into a niche but i think that with with that that was part of the reason why google dropped the nexus platform and is now focusing on the premium experience the ultimate premium Google hardware experience. Um, they, you need somewhere which, to differentiate from everyone else and that the pure Google experience is that's their uh, differentiator. If you want the pure yeah. Google experience, you buy the Pixel phone. Um, it's just like Apple, you pay the Google tax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that's where they're headed and it's, It'll be premium, but it'll be pure Google and it'll be in 
unadulterated experience version of that. And like, you'll see other companies coming out with cheaper home assistance. You'll see other companies coming out with who are like really pushing the barrier forward and what, and what a smartphone really is. And you have those companies doing that. But I think Google's now focusing on bringing their tech in line with where they want um, their technologies and AIs to go forward as a company. Because they're not just a search company anymore. Oh, they're yeah. a little bit more than that. <laughs> so the whole but, kit and caboodle. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Color me impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, before we... I don't know if you guys have ever... Or if any of you guys have tried Google's... Uh, v vr before mm -hmm. um the the daydream view is their new one that got leaked um i, I just looking at it, it looks real sleek i've never tried one of the the phone vrs yeah uh, i've only tried a um the the playstation vr at this point how good is that have you guys tried them at all i have well two Irvin, we know you have i have two <laughs> in my place i've got um well i have different forms of the vr i've got the cardboard i've got um a little bit more of like a nicer made phone headset. Um, and then I've also got the PlayStation VR, but anytime you want, swing by. I'll slide I slide yeah. the pixel into the cardboard headset and let like, you uh, in check out. Yeah. yeah. In terms of phone VR, the only one that I really tried is one that the Gear VR, that it comes with the uh, Samsung uh, phones. And that I'm was that commercial. Yeah, yeah that was a, yeah, actually a really good experience because it's they partnered with Oculus to get the software and the hardware down, um, and they brought over that same interface that they use for the Oculus. So it's pretty good. They have a motion controller now that you can uh, actually you don't have to use like a separate controller. You can use that to point uh, to different things. It's not as perfect as let's say a full Oculus uh, rig or an HTC Vive. Uh, but yeah. it's definitely there are some definitely some good experiences you can have uh, within uh, the phone version uh, one in particular which is my favorite you can uh, sit down and watch netflix in this giant screen you're just sitting in <laughs> nice. this living room and it looks like you're in a movie theater watching That's the netflix sick. show show um, you're just sitting on awesome. your couch with a dark tv just yeah. staring at the movie theater <laughs> with the headset on <laughs> <laughs> and they add some like really nice touches to it. So like when the movie or the TV show or whatever you're watching on Netflix starts, the, all the lights in the room uh, dim. And then uh, as the, the, the video is moving, it's being reflected on the environment too. So it looks like you're actually in like a movie theater. It's like the, the whatever's showing on the screen is being reflected in a way that mimics if you would see like the colors on the on the couch or whatever moving or in your body um so yeah it's really cool experience there's so, also some fun games in there too uh but it's nice. it's it's uh getting more and more uh popular and this daydream is getting more um more compatible with other phones not just the pixel one so oh, nice. now that galaxy s8 is compatible with this daydream view um i know more phones are as well the lg ones i think are are compatible as well so they're getting added to this list of compatible so you just buy this one view um and as long as your phone is compatible you just plop it in there and you start using all the apps um, they have like a that. they have one different color name that i liked a lot and i actually think it's like the, the coolest looking one out of them fog <laughs> Ooh, i like that fancy oh yeah <laughs> super intriguing <laughs> yeah and um well like i said if anybody wants to try it out on daydream I got a pixel. Set up. So Are we over like three, four a.m. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Come on over. Give the dog a walk, and then we'll VR. Yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that being said, uh, I'm excited to see where Google takes this. I think it's going to be a good step forward in in all of their spaces. And that Daydream VR is only going to be further supplemented by their AR core that they're working on. Yep. So. Maybe the next phone will have something with AR core built into it. Ooh, kind of how I'm excited about, about that. I, they might un announce something really interesting on on October fourth. Yeah. Um, Google Glass version two. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I know. Hopefully, nobody gets punched in the face this time. <laughs> the people's at bars. Did you guys hear about that? The person who got punched in the face while wearing Google Glass, who was like running around like, I'm taking a picture of you, I'm recording you. And someone just like 
hit her in the face. <laughs> they were like, yeah. don't record. Yeah, good good for them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but with that being said, I think that's about all we can talk about for the episode, right? Remember, you can yes. yell that at your friends, not a yeah. bunch of strangers in a bar. <laughs> yeah, especially in a bar. You don't want to yell at an intoxicated person that you're recording them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, does anybody have any final topics, anything we might have missed, any leak that they wanted to talk about in more detail? Mm-hmm. No? All right. Well, that concludes leak season then. <laughs> and we'll know more October 4th. So I'm sure that we'll have a special or something dedicated to all of the new technologies that Google talks about because they like to put on a bit of a show just like Apple. But um, with that being said, um, I know you guys are all working on some of your own personal stuff. If anybody wants to plug away, this is the time to do it or forever hold your peace. Uh, If you haven't listened yet, you can always check out my wrestling podcast. Like I said, I've been doing a little bit more with Chase, a little bit less, uh, who's my son, a little bit less with my buddy Keenan, who we started with with on air with Keenan and Kyle. You can find us on iTunes. We're also on air with Keenan dot podomatic.com um and on facebook you can search uh, on air with keenan and kyle twitter i'm at on air keenan kyle uh, and i'm also at kyle fisher 45 but i tweet a lot during pay-per-views we have a wwe has a pay-per-view coming up this weekend excuse me uh which chase and i will be doing a facebook live video and a pod uh to prep you for everything you're going to need to know about that coming up this sunday so please check us out let us know how we did all right, Urban Ryan, you guys have anything you want to plug while you have the floor? Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Wayton Ryan Two One. I do some amateur photography. If you guys want to check that out, I oh, also it's hardly have my... amateur. Yeah. <laughs> my bulls are pro. Yeah. Hard, hardly amateur. Oh, yeah. Look at this. Some good stuff. <laughs> look, look at this amateur shot that, that I'm showing you right now. T- top down city hall. That was a great picture. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm showing yeah, you a flicker. On the video stream, oh, man. Yeah, I saw that one. Flickr page. Uh, Wayne R. Thompson. That's just the extension. It's flickercom slash photo slash Wayne R. Thompson, and that's the photo stream. Very Everything's nice. full run. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna plug uh, for Jeff. If you wanna check out his beats, uh, go to SoundCloud.com slash fre. That's F R E H. If you want to check out his work, what he's working, uh, what he's uh, cooking up in his... I recognize uh, those pictures for those thumbnails. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Love them beats. (laughs) Yeah. He's loving your pictures. Yeah. Uh, You guys can check out my Instagram if you want. Uh, My name, uh, it's just my name, Irvin.Lucas on Instagram. Uh, I don't keep it up to date as much as I'd like, but I'm I'm working on getting more pictures out there uh, for sure. Getting uh, caught up with Thompson. It's, it's hard work. They are spectacular (laughs) already. (laughs) He does. He does. uh, Yeah. You do daily stuff. And man, I got to keep up with you. Um, Can't do that yet, but uh, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. I know you got your eye on that camera, man. Come on now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah. But um, with that being said, I will go ahead and plug us because I care the most, obviously, about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> no. <laughs> but oh. you, can, you can find us on any of the major social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, all at Industry 4.0, all spelled out, or Industry 4.0. We'll probably high enough in search results now to show up as either one. Um, you can also find us on industry40.podbean.com to catch all of our latest episodes as they come out. Um, the, the We frequently share articles to our Facebook, so you can, you're can you most likely to get in touch with one of us directly through Facebook. But aside from that, there's, like I mentioned, there's Twitch, Facebook, um, YouTube, and any of your favorite podcasting apps or podcast aggregators, you can find us on those as well. So uh that's that's about it for everything that we are available on and i think that's a wrap for episode 20 it's been 20 episodes my god yeah <laughs> it flies by so fast I'm looking forward that's one per to 20, 20 more and yeah, 100 more gotta... and <laughs> keeping this going as long as possible because i love I'm it looking, 
I yeah, enjoy it every too. single it's week. It's nice to keep up on tech and share this news yeah. with everybody who cares. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, with that, um, this has been episode 20 and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in the next episode. See ya.